Each continent on our planet boasts its own records. Some have the hottest place on Earth, others the coldest, the driest or the wettest, and so on. We have covered nearly all of these in our previous videos. However, there is one unique continent that holds the most records of all. In fact, it is a record in itself because it's the largest, the most diverse, and the most fascinating one. With a population of over 5 billion people, it is home to more people than any other place on our planet. It's not hard to guess that we are talking about Eurasia. In today's video, you will learn what epic cataclysm led to the formation of Mount Everest? Are there monkeys in Europe? Who invented numbers? And what does Eurasia have to do with it? And who actually discovered Eurasia? Eurasia, a champion continent. Please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. By doing so, you'll let the YouTube algorithm know that you like these types of videos. This way, even more interesting and educational content will pop up in your recommended videos. Eurasia accounts for about 36% of the planet's landmass, covering 53.6 million square kilometers, about 20.7 million square miles. It is the only continent on Earth washed by four oceans. The highest point on the continent is Mount Everest, also known as Chomolungma, with an elevation of nearly 8,849 meters, 29,031 feet. This towering peak is also the highest on the planet when measured from sea level. The lowest point on the planet is also located in Eurasia. It's the Gore Depression, a world record holder among terrestrial depressions. At its bottom lies the world-famous Dead Sea in Israel. And the lowest land point on Earth, not submerged underwater, is 432 meters, 1,419 feet below sea level. The continent also boasts the deepest lake on the planet, Lake Baikal. At its maximum depth reaches 1,642 meters, 5,387 feet. Additionally, the largest lake, the Caspian Sea, is also found in Eurasia. Wait, is it actually a lake or a sea? Technically, the Caspian Sea is a lake, as it's not connected to the world ocean. But it is saline, and so vast that it is commonly considered a sea. The Arabian Peninsula, the world's largest peninsula, is another geographical marvel in Eurasia, located in the southwestern part of the continent. It spans an area of 3,237,500 square kilometers, 1,250,000 square miles. It's large enough to accommodate nearly six countries the size of France. While you can simply list the records, they are much more interesting to learn about in context. And first, we'll explore geography. Eurasia encompasses more than one-third of the Earth's landmass. Of this, four-fifths belong to Asia and one-fifth to Europe. And now seems like a perfect time to explore what Europe and Asia represent in geographical terms. These are two parts of the world traditionally identified as parts of Eurasia. Europe and Asia themselves are not continents. A conventional boundary divides Europe and Asia. The official demarcation between Europe and Asia is a line going through the Aegean Sea, the Dardanelles, the Sea of Marmara, the Bosporus, the Black Sea, along the watershed of the main Caucasian range, the northwestern part of the Caspian Sea, then along the Ural River and extending from the Ural Mountains to the Arctic Ocean. Eurasia is so vast that it is bordered by nearly all existing oceans on the planet, the Atlantic Ocean to the west, the Arctic Ocean to the north, the Pacific Ocean to the east, and the Indian Ocean to the south. Of course, Eurasia also has its own seas within these oceans, 
including the Baltic, North, Mediterranean, Black, Red, Arabian, South China, Yellow, Sea of Japan, Sea of Okhotsk, and Bering Sea, to just name a few. Furthermore, Eurasia has numerous bays. For example, the Bothnian, Finnish, Bay of Biscay, Persian, Gulf of Oman, Bay of Bengal, Suez, and a bunch of smaller ones. This continent also boasts an abundance of straits, including Gibraltar, Bosporus, Dardanelles, English Channel, Bering Strait, Bab el Mandeb, among others. Eurasia has a highly indented coastline, resulting in many peninsulas Arabian, Indostan, Indochina, Iberian, Apennine, Anatolian, Scandinavian, Kamchatka, Tamir, Yamal, Kola, and many smaller ones. There are also plenty of large and small islands. Iceland, Great Britain, Sakhalin, Sri Lanka, and the Greater Sunda Islands, which include Java, Borneo, Sulawesi, Sumatra, and the Philippines. No other continent even comes close to boasting such a diversity of seas, bays, straits, peninsulas, and islands. The Eurasian landmass extends far in all directions. From north to south, Eurasia stretches over 8,500 kilometers, 5,280 miles. The northernmost continental point of Eurasia is Cape Chelyuskin located on the Tamir Peninsula. The southernmost continental point of Eurasia is Cape Pi, situated at the southern tip of the Malay Peninsula in Malaysia. This cape is just 140 kilometers, 87 miles from the equator. Thus, we can immediately infer that Eurasia is located in all the climatic zones, which change from north to south. Shortly, you will learn how this has influenced the continent's wildly diverse flora and fauna. Eurasia's span from west to east is even greater. By some estimates, it's up to 18,000 kilometers, over 11,000 miles. The continent stretches across the entire eastern hemisphere, and its extreme western and eastern points enter the western hemisphere from different sides. The westernmost point of Eurasia is in the Western Hemisphere, on the Iberian Peninsula in Portugal, known as Cape Roca. The easternmost mainland point of Eurasia is Cape Dezhnev in Russia, located on the Chukotka Peninsula. But the honor of being the discoverer was awarded to another person. You will find out who later on. By the way, Semyon Dezhnev was a Russian explorer who first reached the edge of Eurasia and proved that there is a strait between two continents, North America and Eurasia. We now get to a question that might seem strange or even amusing. Who discovered Eurasia? Indeed, was there a Christopher Columbus for Eurasia? Indeed, this question might sound peculiar, but let's talk about it anyway. Eurasia is the cradle of many ancient civilizations that developed on the continent over many millennia. The scientific and cultural heritage of ancient China, India, Babylon, and Assyria laid the foundation for the scientific potential of the modern era. We'll talk more about this later, and you'll have many unexpected insights, so be sure to stay tuned until the end. So, Eurasia was gradually discovered by its inhabitants, who had no idea of the continent's size. For example, the Phoenicians were the first to explore the Mediterranean coastline. The ancient Greeks continued to explore new territories. They sailed in many European seas, discovered the Apennine and Balkan peninsulas, and reached the lands of modern Spain and France. However, the greatest surge in discoveries spanned from the Middle Ages to the 21st century. Thanks to many daring travelers, humanity gained a complete understanding of the largest continent on the planet. Eurasian explorers lived at different times in different countries. They discovered all the parts of the continent one by one. The truly great discovery was that all these parts belonged to one continent, 
which later came to be known as Eurasia. We should thank the Austrian geologist Edward Seuss for the name Eurasia, who proposed it in the 1880s. You might wonder, why does the name deserve a special thanks? The thing is, before him, other scientists had proposed more cumbersome or even preposterous names. Geographer Carl Gustav Reuschel suggested the double continent of Asia-Europe, and Alexander von Humboldt, the founder of geography as a separate science, used the name Asia for the entire continent. Regarding the discoverers, we can regard Marco Polo as a kind of Eurasian Columbus. He was a famous Phoenician merchant and sailor, known for his exceptional memory. After undertaking an extensive journey to the southern shores of Asia, he meticulously documented his travels in his renowned book, known by various names such as The Book of the Marvels of the World, or simply The Travels of Marco Polo. And here is a surprising fact. Guess who had this book as a favorite read? Christopher Columbus. After all, Marco Polo made his great geographical discoveries between 1276 and 1291, but Columbus was born much later, in 1451. Notably, this book accompanied Columbus during his quest for a new route to India, which ultimately led to the discovery of America. Researchers estimate that Columbus made about 70 notes in Polo's book. It can be said that Eurasia's discovery was a gradual process that unfolded over several centuries, associated with many great minds. Vasco da Gama, the famous explorer who was the first European to visit India. Piotr Semyonov Tian Shansky, a distinguished explorer who introduced Europe to the majestic Tian Shan mountain range. He paved the way for subsequent expeditions to Central and Middle Asia. Nikolai Perzhevalsky, another esteemed Russian traveler and explorer of Central Asia. He was the first to describe the wild nature in this region. Vitas Bering, yet another Russian mariner who made a crucial geographical discovery. He discovered the strait connecting Eurasia and North America, which naturally was named after him. These individuals represent just a fraction of the many brave explorers and travelers who made astonishing discoveries, often risking their own lives. Thanks to them, our view of the world became more complete and vivid. With the discovery sorted, it's now time to delve into how Eurasia is structured. To accurately comprehend the geological structure of the continent, one must know its formation history. Scientists believe that it took three geological epochs to form, which is why the continent of Eurasia has a rather complex geological structure. In geological terms, it is the youngest continent, formed during the Mesozoic and Cenozoic eras. First, let's delve into Eurasia's very core and find out what constitutes its foundation, what it literally stands on. The oldest platforms of the continent share a similar structure, with a crystalline base underpinning a sedimentary cover composed of both marine and continental sedimentary rocks. Despite similarities, each platform has some unique features. The Chinese platform is literally split into separate parts, the largest being the South and North China cratons. The Arabian platform is bisected by a rift, the Siberian and Indian platforms are characterized by deep faults, allowing magmatic rocks to penetrate their sedimentary covers. The thickness of this cover varies greatly in different regions, from tens of miles to almost zero, where bare crystalline shields are exposed. The predominance of mountainous landscapes on the continent is a result of active tectonic movements caused by the convergence and thrusting of lithospheric plates. It is estimated that mountains and plateaus account for up to 65% of Eurasia's territory. Don't you find it a little surprising? Mountains account for over half of the largest continent. But it's true. This makes Eurasia also the highest continent, with an average elevation of about 838 meters, 2,750 feet above sea level. The second largest type of Eurasian relief is plains. 
mountains and plains are the main forms of relief on the continent. Unique to Eurasia, both its mountains and plains are the largest in terms of area and height, compared to other continents where mountain ranges are typically at the edges. In Eurasia, they are found both at the edges and deep within the continent. Different geological schools identify various orogenic belts, which include the continent's mountain ranges and plains that separate them. The two oldest belts are the Caledonian orogeny, comprising the Scandinavian mountains and the mountains of Great Britain, and the Central Asian orogenic belt, the latter being the longer one. It encompasses systems of different ages, Novaya Zemlya and the Ural Mountains, Altai and Sayans, the Yenisi Ridge, Central Kazakhstan, and Tian Shan, Central Mongolia. Then there's the Alpide Belt, stretching from the Strait of Gibraltar to Indonesia. It includes the Pyrenees, Alps, Carpathians, Crimea, Caucasus, and the majestic Himalayas with Everest. Last but not least, the Pacific Belt. It's the largest and most active one on the planet, which earned it a dramatic name, the Pacific Ring of Fire. This is a kind of hellish entity, a giant tectonic belt around 40,000 kilometers, 25,000 miles long, and up to 500 kilometers, 310 miles wide, encircling the Pacific Ocean. Why a hellish entity? because it contains between 750 to 915 volcanoes, accounting for about two-thirds of the world's total number. The Ring of Fire has up to 90% of the world's earthquakes, including 81% of the largest ones. A significant part of this gigantic formation falls within Eurasia. It stretches from the Vorkoyansk and Chursky mountain ranges, along the Chukotka Peninsula, Kamchatka, the islands of the Japanese, and Malay archipelagos. Since mountains occupy more than half of Eurasia's territory, it's worth examining them in more detail. Let's start with the continent's true pride. The Himalayas are the world's largest mountain system. Located in Asia, they span across five countries and cover an area of about 595,000 square kilometers nearly 223,000 square miles. This massive range stretches 2,400 kilometers, 1,500 miles, with the width varying from 350 kilometers, 220 miles in the west, to 150 kilometers, 93 miles in the east. This is a terraced system, with the average height of its peaks being 6,000 meters, 19,700 feet. The Himalayas have over 100 peaks exceeding 7,200 meters, 23,600 feet above sea level, including 10 peaks over 8 kilometers, 5 miles high, among them the world's highest mountain, Everest. The Himalayas formed as a result of the collision between the Eurasian and Indo-Australian plates about 25 million years ago. However, the process itself began much earlier. If one could go back in time and observe this in a time lapse, it would be an epic show. At that time, the Indian subcontinent was an island which collided full force with Southern Asia, transforming into a peninsula. With enormous momentum, it began to crumple everything in its path. While this is a typical process in mountain formation, this particular case was unique due to the similar geological densities of the colliding masses. Instead of one plate submerging into the mantle, as in the case of subduction, both plates began to crumple into a gigantic accordion. This collision gave rise to the Earth's highest mountains and the largest plateau, Tibet. So vast was this planetary scale collision and by the way, it's still ongoing. The Indian subcontinent hasn't yet expended its energy, so this colossal impact continues, making the Himalayas grow even higher. In the next 10 million years, 
it's projected to push into southern Asia by an additional 1,500 kilometers, over 900 miles. Now, let's shift our focus to another part of the world, Europe. The Alps are the tallest mountain range in Europe. This system spans 1,200 kilometers, 750 miles in length, and up to 250 kilometers, 160 miles in width. Its highest peak, Mont Blanc, stands at 4,805 meters, 15,766 feet, and is located on the border of Italy and France. This massive range significantly influences Europe's climate by acting as a barrier to cold air masses from the North Atlantic. Of course, we can't overlook the Ural Mountains in Russia. Besides conventionally dividing Europe and Asia, they also significantly influence the climate of nearby territories. This mountain range extends 2,500 kilometers, 1,600 miles, with the widest part exceeding 150 kilometers, 93 miles. It is believed that these mountains have been around for 300 million years. But there are too many mountains in Eurasia to explore all of them, so let's come down from the peaks. Eurasia is also renowned for its plains and has six of the 10 largest plains on the planet. The East European Plain, second only in size to the Amazon Basin, spans just under 4 million square kilometers, 2 million square miles. From the Scandinavian and Sudeten Mountains to the Ural and the Caucasus, the plain's dimensions virtually match those of the East European platform, shaping its relief. Other notable formations include the Central Siberian Plateau, the Arabian Plateau, and the West Siberian Lowland, as well as two other large plains, the Deccan Plateau and the Indo-Gangetic Plain, both located on the Indian subcontinent. Let's not forget about the deserts. Eurasia is home to the Gobi Desert, the sixth largest desert in the world and the largest one in Asia. It's a vast arc formed by a long chain of local deserts and semi-deserts, stretching over 1,600 kilometers, 1,000 miles from the southwest to the northeast, and 800 kilometers, 500 miles from north to south, covering the southern third of Mongolia and the northern provinces of China. Yet, deserts aren't Eurasia's most defining feature. The continent is much richer in water bodies. Thanks to its impressive size, Eurasia boasts hundreds of water-rich and long rivers. No other continent is so abundant in large water bodies. The Arctic Ocean receives water from the short rivers of the Scandinavian Peninsula and Eurasia's largest rivers like the Obe, Yenisei, Lena, Northern Davina, and Peshora, all located in Russia. These rivers primarily rely on snowmelt for their flow, freeze over for extensive periods in winter, and undergo heavy flooding in spring. The Lena is the longest among these rivers. The Lena is the longest among these rivers, while the Yenisei is the most voluminous. Lake Baikal, the world's deepest lake, belongs to the Arctic Ocean Basin. The rivers of Western, Southern, and partly Eastern Europe belong to the Atlantic Ocean Basin. The rivers of Western and Southern Europe mainly originate in the mountains. Western Europe has a dense network of rivers and many freshwater lakes. In the Far West's maritime climate, rivers remain unfrozen and full-flowing throughout the year. The largest among them is the Seine. Rivers like the Vistula, Oder, and Elbe freeze only briefly. The largest rivers of the Atlantic Basin are the Danube, Rhine, and Dnieper. Rivers flowing into the Mediterranean Sea are usually short and shallow. In summer, they often dry up, with many running dry entirely. However, the region is also abundant in lakes, particularly glacial tectonic lakes in northwestern Europe. The largest are Ladoga and Oniga in Russia. Central Europe has tectonic lakes such as Lake Constance, Lake Geneva, Lake Balaton, and many others that are smaller in size. 
The large rivers of the Pacific Basin originate in high mountains. Apart from the northern part of the continent, Pacific Basin rivers are rain-fed, maintaining a consistent flow year-round. In areas with a monsoon climate, like that of the Amur River, river water levels fluctuate significantly based on the season. Prominent rivers such as the Yellow River, Yangtze, and Mekong originate from the Tibetan Plateau. The Indus, Ganges, Brahmaputra, Tigris, and Euphrates are the most notable among the major rivers of the Indian Ocean Basin. They are replenished by rain and ice. Eurasia also hosts rivers that do not contribute their waters to any ocean. For instance, the Volga, the largest river in Europe, flows into the Caspian Sea, which is not connected to the world ocean. Eurasia's interior regions, comprised of deserts and semi-deserts, are almost devoid of watercourses. The largest rivers here are the Amu Darya and Sir Darya, mainly sustained by glacial and snowmelt. These rivers once fed into the Aral Sea, which has nearly disappeared. The river waters now vanish in the Aralcum, a new desert formed in its place. Technically, the Aral Sea was also a lake. As previously mentioned, Eurasia is washed by four oceans, each differently influencing its climatic conditions and the distribution of natural zones. The variation depends on the nature of the coastline, the location of major relief forms such as mountains, the prevailing wind directions, as well as the temperature of ocean currents. The presence of oceans brings air masses that deliver life-sustaining moisture. Now seems like a perfect time to explore the climate of Eurasia. Let's start with the Pacific Ocean side. Pacific air masses influence the climate of only a small portion of Eurasia's eastern coast. Arctic air from the Arctic Ocean becomes continental and influences the continent's climate due to the absence of latitudinal mountain ranges. The Himalayas limit the impact of the Indian Ocean's air masses, so all precipitation remains at the foothills. That's why the Masanram, located in northeastern India, is considered the wettest place on Earth. It literally means the land of clouds. The annual average precipitation here is 11,872 millimeters, 467 inches. Eurasia spans all seven climatic zones, Arctic, subarctic, temperate, subtropical, tropical, subequatorial, and equatorial. The North Atlantic current with its warm waters plays a crucial role in shaping the Eurasian climate. It facilitates the spread of precipitation inland and warms Western Europe. The northern islands and continental coast of the Arctic Ocean have an Arctic climate type. Cold air masses from the Arctic prevail throughout the year. A sharply continental climate type is observed in Iceland and northern Scandinavia, characterized by long, harsh winters and brief summers. The temperate zone occupies the most extensive territory. It encompasses four climatic regions. The moderately maritime climatic type is observed in the extreme west near the Atlantic coast. The winter season here is warm and the summer is cool. Precipitation occurs throughout the year. Cyclones cause weather changes, bringing warmth in summer and coolness in winter. The moderately continental climate type dominates the east. As one moves away from the ocean, precipitation decreases and winters become harsher. This is the continental climate type, found in Central Asia and Siberia. Continental air masses dominate here throughout the year. Winter is long and extremely cold. Summer can be very hot. There are stark temperature contrasts between seasons. The eastern part of Eurasia is characterized by a monsoon climate type, known for its sharp temperature differences. Winds bring moisture from the Pacific coast, making the summer season rainy and warm. Winter monsoons bring cold continental air masses, increasing atmospheric pressure and resulting in dry and windy winters. The subtropical zone stretches across all of Eurasia, 
The subtropical Mediterranean climate type is observed in the southwestern part of the continent, along with the Mediterranean coast. Summers here are dry and hot, while winters are rainy and warm. The subtropical climate type is found in the central regions of the subtropics. Summers are hot, winters are cold with sparse precipitation. In the eastern part of the subtropical zone, the subtropical monsoon climate type is prevalent, especially in China and Japan. The Arabian Peninsula and the Iranian Plateau are characterized by a dry desert tropical climate type with extremely hot summers. In the equatorial belt, a maritime equatorial climate prevails, characterized by abundant rainfall and high temperatures. While continental climate types are widespread, Eurasia encompasses all possible natural zones, resulting in an exceptionally diverse nature. Now, let's explore this truly vibrant natural kaleidoscope. The distribution of modern wild fauna across the territory depends on the characteristics of natural conditions and, of course, human activity. Of course, we've played our part here, and it wasn't the best one. Let's start with the north. The most common large mammal in the tundra is the reindeer. The tundra is also home to the arctic fox, lemming, and arctic hare. Among birds, the willow ptarmigan and rock ptarmigan are the most widespread. In the summer, seagulls, loons, mergansers, geese, ducks, and swans migrate to the tundra. The wildlife of the forest zone is best preserved in the taiga, home to wolves, brown bears, moose, lynxes, foxes, squirrels, wolverines, martens, and sables. Birds include capercaillies, black grouses, ptarmigans, and crossbills. The coastal waters, rivers, and lakes of northern Eurasia are also rich in fish. Now, let's move to the southwest. Animals typical of steppe habitats are commonly found in such zones, including the steppe polecat, ground squirrels, various mice and voles. Among the large animals, the saiga antelope is still around. Birds are quite diverse. Some of the most iconic species are larks, swallows, and falcons. The faunal profile of the Anatolian Plateau, the Armenian Highlands, and the Iranian Plateau include typical ungulates, such as gazelles, antelopes, wild donkeys, Central Asian mountain sheep, and goats. Predators include leopards, lynxes, caracals, jackals, hyenas, and some fox species. There is a large population of hares, gerboas, gerbils, and even porcupines. Birds in Western Asia, especially those from the Central Asian deserts and steppes, include species like bustards, grouses, larks, and desert jays. Herons, flamingos, and pelicans are found near water bodies. There is also a great variety of reptiles, especially lizards and snakes, steppe pythons, vipers, horned vipers, rat snakes, and grass snakes. Moreover, there is a great abundance of arthropods, including solifuges, scorpions, and tarantulas. Reptiles, rodents, and ungulates dominate in the semi-deserts and deserts. Central Asia is home to the two-humped camel and the wild donkey, otherwise known as the kulan. In the mountain forests of southern China, the black Himalayan bear, leopard, and the iconic panda, a symbol of wildlife conservation, are found. Tigers roam in dense riverine bamboo and reed thickets, occasionally extending to the upper forest limit. The fauna of broadleafed forests include the endemic raccoon dog and the far eastern forest cat. India and Indochina are known for their abundance of monkeys and a wide variety of reptiles, particularly venomous snakes. Now let's transition from Asia to Europe and explore the wildlife there. European forests were once teeming with numerous large mammals, both predators and herbivores, hunted for their meat or valuable fur. Today, although their numbers have drastically declined, species such as the bison, roe deer, 
red deer, wolverine, pine marten, polecat, weasel, wildcat, fox, hedgehog, mountain hare, and European hare are still around. The brown bear no longer inhabits plains, instead favoring mountainous areas, particularly the Carpathians. Notable among the endemic mountain species are the chamois, mountain goats, and marmots. Mixed and broadleaf forests house partridges, black grouses, capercallies, and hazel grouses. These forests are also alive with songbirds, including thrushes, orioles, warblers, and nightingales. Owls, eagle owls, pigeons, and cuckoos are frequently seen. Waterfowl nest around water bodies. Swallows, rooks, and storks prefer to make their homes near human settlements. Most of these birds are migratory. In autumn, entire aerial caravans of geese, ducks, cranes, and flocks of rooks follow precise migration routes southward, only to return to their nesting sites in spring. The rivers and lakes are mainly populated by carp species, but salmonids are also found. The fauna of southern Europe includes primitive predators, birds, monkeys, and a large number of amphibians and reptiles, which are almost absent in the more northern regions of Eurasia. Yes, you heard that right. There are monkeys in Europe. The colony of Barbary macaques in Gibraltar is the only one living in the wild in the entirety of Europe. The common gannet, a member of the vivarid family, lives in the Pyrenees and southern France. If you haven't heard this word until now, then seeing once is better than hearing it twice. Look how cute this cat is. But keep in mind that it's a fierce predator. Wild goats still roam the mountainous areas with sparse vegetation in the Aegean Islands and the southern Balkan Peninsula. In the Mediterranean, goats are widespread and in some areas are the sole domestic animals. Southern Europe is home to the Pyrenean desmond, porcupine, jackal, and wild rabbit. The region's bird life, as distinctive as its mammals, includes the blue magpie, rock partridge, Sardinian warbler, Spanish and rock sparrow, among others. Predatory birds such as the black vulture, griffin vulture, and bearded vulture are also common. Reptiles flourish in the dry climate. Endemic species include gecko lizards, chameleons, the Mediterranean viper, and other snake species. Terrestrial turtles are represented by the Greek tortoise. The region also has an abundance of arthropods, including scorpions, freshwater crabs, a variety of beetles, cicadas, and vividly colored butterflies. Let's revisit Central Asia and take a closer look at these fascinating lands. The desert plateaus and mountain ranges of Central Asia have some unique fauna. It is characterized by a relative scarcity of species and a dominance of ungulates and rodents. These animals are adapted to the vast, treeless, and waterless expanses characteristic of Central Asia's heartland, where few creatures choose to reside. Some animals are restricted to specific areas of Central Asia, while others are widespread throughout the region. The wild yak, for instance, is almost exclusively native to Tibet. This large animal thrives on the sparse vegetation of high desert plateaus and endures the harsh continental climate, though it cannot withstand high temperatures. In the Tibetan Plateau and Central Asian mountains, Argali, Attics, and Marco Polo sheep are quite common. The Mongolian gazelle, wild ass, kulan, and the extremely rare kiang, along with the wild two-humped Bactrian camel roam the steppe and semi-desert plains of Mongolia and northwest China. Predators in Central Asia are not as varied as ungulates. In the mountains, one can find the snow leopard, also known as the uns, as well as the Tibetan subspecies of the brown bear and wolf. Foxes, gray wolves, weasels, and jackals are almost ubiquitous. Rodents are abundantly represented in plains and mountainous areas, both in terms of species diversity and population size. Birds are especially diverse in mountainous areas. 
including the Himalayan Manal, Tibetan Snowcock, Alpine Chaff, Bearded Vulture, and Wall Creeper. On the plains, bustards, partridges, and larks are commonly seen. Central Asia has few reptiles and amphibians, but some lizard and snake species and the land tortoise are prevalent. The rest of southern Eurasia, within the Indo-Malayan realm, is characterized by a rich biodiversity and ancient wildlife. Notable ungulates of the Malay archipelago include the Malayan or two-colored tapir, which has relatives in South America, the one-horned Indian and two-horned Sumatran rhinoceroses, and the wild bantang, ancestor of Balinese domestic cattle, the Indian buffalo, and the gaur. Among omnivores, the Malayan bear, curiously named the sun bear, stands out as perhaps the strangest and smallest bear in the world. On the islands of Sumatra and Kalimantan, one of the great ape species, the orangutan, is found. Gibbons, old world monkeys, and some species of macaques are quite common. Tree shrews and primitive primates like lorises, closely related to primates and insectivores, are also present. The giant Komodo dragon, the largest of modern lizards, inhabits the relatively small island of Komodo reaching 3 meters, 9.8 feet in length, and weighing up to 70 kilograms, 150 pounds. The rivers of Kalimantan host the large gharial crocodile. There are many venomous snakes, with cobras being the most dangerous. Pythons are also common, the largest being the reticulated python, which is the longest snake in the world, and the third heaviest after the anaconda and the Burmese python reaching up to 6.5 meters, 21 feet, 4 inches in length, and weighing up to 75 kilograms, 165 pounds. As we can see, Eurasian wildlife can easily rival that of any other continent. But even more fascinating is the world of humans. We are accustomed to marveling at the exotic ancient civilizations of South America or Egypt, Yet, these become insignificant when compared to the immense and diverse array of civilizations that originated in Eurasia, whose legacies have shaped the modern world. We often don't even know whom to thank for the most commonplace things. Get ready to learn about some astonishing discoveries. Ancient Rome represents a massive epoch in human civilization, originating in the 8th century BCE and concluding in the 1500 CE, it has profoundly influenced the entire world as we know it today. The Romans perfected primitive Egyptian irrigation canals and created a comprehensive aqueduct system. This was a colossal breakthrough. Aqueducts, fountains, public baths, toilets, and underground sewer systems, all these were conceived, invented, and built by the Romans. Many ancient Roman structures like the Pantheon, Colosseum, and Roman Forum have survived to this day thanks to the use of cement and concrete. Yep, the Romans also invented concrete. They began using it in the construction of aqueducts, buildings, bridges, and monuments more than 2,100 years ago throughout the Mediterranean basin. Roman concrete, while not as strong as its modern counterpart, was surprisingly durable due to its unique formula. The Romans used slacked lime and volcanic ash, creating a kind of sticky paste. This mixture was exceptionally chemically stable. Such concrete maintained its properties even when submerged in seawater, allowing its use in building piers and harbors. Of course, we owe the concept of roads not just pathways, but as a civilizational invention to Roman civilization. At its peak, the Roman Empire spanned nearly 5 million square kilometers, about 2 million square miles, encompassing most of southern Europe. To effectively manage such a vast territory, the Romans built the most sophisticated road system of the ancient world, adhering to strict standards in road design including the creation of specialized channels for water drainage. By 200 CE, the Romans constructed over 80,000 kilometers, 50,000 miles of roads. 
milestones provided travelers with distances to their destinations, while specialized military units served as a sort of road police. Many of these standards have endured and spread globally with the expansion of Western civilization. How about something more refined? As true Eurasians, the Romans excelled here too. For much of our history, literature was confined to cumbersome clay tablets and scrolls. The Romans revolutionized this by introducing stacks of bound pages, a precursor to the modern book. Initially crafted from bound wax tablets, these soon evolved into parchment, the finest untanned leather. Indeed, every book, notebook, or journal on your desk is a legacy of Roman civilization. But there's an even more fundamental legacy. The modern Gregorian calendar closely resembles its Roman version that emerged over 2,000 years ago. The Julian calendar calculated a year as 365.25 days, adding an extra quarter day. In contrast, the Gregorian calendar computes a year as 365.2422 days, offering more precise timekeeping than the Julian model. Roman scientists and priests went through a long, complex, and at times paradoxical journey before they could develop the Gregorian calendar. In terms of structure and principle, it's almost identical to the Julian one. Not only the calendar, but many modern legal terms also originate from the Roman legal system, which dominated for centuries. The global historical significance of Roman law lies in its universality, forming the basis of modern codes, especially civil laws. This is just a fraction of the legacy of one of Eurasia's most impactful civilizations. But there were others whose influence we also observe every day. Another civilization that originated in Eurasia, and the one that we can talk about for hours, is ancient Greece. It made a colossal contribution to world culture. We owe theater, literature, medicine, and politics to the ancient Greeks. But it gave us far more than spiritual values. The first prototype of the modern lifting crane appeared about 2,500 years ago and was used for building stone temples in Corinth and Isthmia. This ancient machine could move blocks weighing up to 400 kilograms, 880 pounds, and lift people to the construction sites. The winch, too, was likely first used in ancient Greece. Thanks to the first mechanism using a winch, human productivity increased by six to sevenfold. The forerunner to the modern screw mechanism is credited to the renowned ancient Greek scientist and engineer Archimedes. The screw-like mechanism he invented was used to transfer water from low-lying bodies of water to fields and cities. It was powered by draft animals or slaves. Sadly, high art, poetry, and engineering coexisted in ancient society with such a heinous phenomenon as slavery. The ancient Greek mechanic and mathematician Heron of Alexandria is credited with inventing the first steam engine in human history. However, initially, the device wasn't intended to convert steam energy into mechanical work, but was used for pneumatic experiments. Furthermore, central heating, a pair of compasses, and the odometer were also invented in ancient Greece. And that's far from a complete list. We've only briefly reviewed two of the most significant civilizations born in the European part of Eurasia. But what about the Asian part? The legacy there is not only equally significant, but perhaps even more extensive, albeit less noticeable. Take, for instance, ancient China. A civilization that developed in this area for millennia invented things that proved to be so significant and fundamental for our modern civilization that we now set them apart, collectively referring to them as the four great inventions, the compass, gunpowder, paper, and printing. Yet, this represents only a fraction of its legacy. Within the scope of our topic, it's impossible to list everything that was invented and found application in ancient China. 
especially given the abundance of even the fundamental ideas and inventions, not to mention the more secondary ones. For example, the Chinese were the first to think of salting food. The earliest confirmed use of salt dates back to around 6000 BCE at Lake Yongchen, Shangxi province. Interestingly, the Chinese used forks long before Europeans. Wait, what? What about the famous Chinese chopsticks? Yes, that's right. Archaeologists discovered bone forks in burial sites of the Kajia culture of the Bronze Age, 2400 to 1900 BCE. And only in the Middle Ages did China begin to use chopsticks. Forks were also found in burials from the Shang Dynasty, 1600 to 1050 BCE, and subsequent dynasties. The list of Chinese inventions is extensive, including oars, lacquer, bells, hand crossbows, drilling rigs, fans, blast furnaces, bristle toothbrushes, and playing cards, to name a few. Remarkably, the first paper banknotes also originated in China. We've just briefly touched on the legacy of only three of the most prominent Eurasian civilizations, but there was also the ancient Indian civilization, from which we derive the numeral system commonly referred to as Arabic, because it was the Arabs who introduced these numbers to Europe. Invented in the 5th century in India, these numerals were popularized by the scholar Abu Jafar Muhammad bin Musa al-Khwarizmi. Thanks to him, the terms algorithm and algebra have been introduced to mathematics. As you can hear, these words closely resemble al-Khwarizmi's name, and that's far from an extensive list. The Phoenicians contributed to the creation of the alphabet, which became the basis for many modern writing systems. The road network built by the ancient Persians was one of the iconic engineering projects of that time. And every educated person knows about ancient Babylon, with its incredible civilization bloom for those times. All of this represents Eurasia. All these civilizations are children of this vast, very diverse, and in every sense, amazing continent. Everything could have been fine. But the modern world is different from what it used to be. Long gone are the days when we lived in harmony with nature, and now we risk losing the Eurasia our not-so-distant ancestors once knew. Human impact through both direct and indirect destruction of valuable plant and animal species, and crucially, alteration of their habitats, is becoming increasingly threatening. Many Eurasian fauna species are at risk of extinction. This includes 471 mammal species, 389 bird species, 276 fish species, 85 reptile species, and 33 amphibian species. About two-thirds of all wild animal habitats in Asia have been destroyed. In China, up to 20% of species are at risk of extinction. Among the seven endemic mammals of Western Asia, four species, the Arabian leopard, striped hyena, Arabian tar, and Arabian wolf are endangered. The situation with species loss and habitat destruction in Western Europe shows little sign of improvement. In Asian regions, the most significant ecological problems include deforestation and land desertification in Central Asia. The temperate zone has also undergone significant changes. The plains of Western Europe have seen near complete deforestation, and the once continuous belt of broadleaf forests in Central Europe now exists in only fragmented patches. It's frightening to imagine what's happening in Siberia. Active deforestation is occurring in some high mountain areas as well. For instance, in the Himalayas within Nepal, Almost half of all forests have been cut down over the last few decades. Even the least habitable northern tundra regions with very fragile ecological balance have been affected by human activity, not to mention the amount of human waste. The population is increasing, and the waste problems in many Eurasian countries is catastrophic, leading to irreversible consequences. Does it mean we've crossed the point of no return?